happening? Some of y'all I've seen a lot this weekend. <laughs> it's been a full weekend here at First Unitarian, and I hope that something you heard or experienced here this weekend made a difference for you. It's really great, really great to see all of you this evening for a special event. Um, I want to introduce my longtime Facebook friend and my new in-person friend, uh, the Reverend Dennis McCarty, who's a Utah native, and this was his uh, sponsoring church when he was an intern minister back in the 90s. So it's coming home in a way. Uh, Reverend McCarty comes, for, comes to us from Bloomington, Indiana, where he lives with his life partner, Kate, and two pampered cats. Dennis decided at age seven that he wanted to be a writer, and so he's been writing novels, songs, plays, nonfiction books, and lots of sermons ever since. Um, Dennis loves music and is in awe of real musicians. Oh, come on now. <laughs> he does not really consider himself one, but his enthusiasm for music is infectious. He wrote all the songs in the show that you're about to see, and they reflect his love for a wide range of popular music. And let me tell you about him as a minister. Dennis became interested in Unitarian Universalism while in his 20s. From the beginning, this included fascination with the life and death of Michael Servetus. Dennis wanted to write a play about Servetus while he was in divinity school. And so he worked on it on and off for several years. There's a full cast version set up for several actors and a rock and roll band. They're not here tonight. I know. Next time, yes, uh, but tonight it'll be Dennis himself. So, Dennis invites you to think of yourself as the townspeople of a village 400 years ago, gathered on the village green to hear a troubadour tell you a story and sing some songs from long, long ago and far, far away. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Servetus. The Radical Reformed Musical. Yeah. Thank you. I, I really appreciate being here. Uh, as Monica said, uh, I came of age in Salt Lake City. Uh, I was a member of First Unitarian Church when I decided to go to uh, theological school. And you were my sponsoring congregation, which does add, I will admit, <clears throat> a certain terror factor. Uh, but I'll tell you a story because, uh, and I don't consider myself a musician. I'm an all of musicians and I love music. But you know what? And this is important. If you like music, make some. Average people have a right and obligation to make music too. And one of the coolest thing experiences I had when studying for ministry, I, I did a chaplain uh, residency in Chicago and uh, spent an evening with a family of a man who had just lost his wife. And uh, it, it, for re reasons I'll never completely understand, asynchronicity, it turned into a sing-along. I would brought my guitar and I had a copy of Rise Up Singing, some folks will know what that is, and we started a sing-along. And this guy could not carry a tune in a bushel basket, but he loved to sing. And it was really quite a beautiful evening. It was a beautiful time. And so one of the learning pieces is if you like music, you know, make some. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's professional level music, make some. And probably the other, the other piece is even if you're scared, do it anyway. It helps make the world a better place. So... As Monica said, I wrote the. I, actually, I, I should probably say, I wrote this uh, while on sabbatical in 2009. Uh, so uh, when it comes time for your minister to take a sabbatical, it's a good idea. Good things happen for, for you and for them. Uh, and it kind of developed over the years. Uh, but it has not been fully produced. There have been Sunday morning versions. and uh, uh, But it has not been fully produced. And I finally decided... Uh, fear factor aside, I decided if this thing was ever going to get out and people were going to appreciate this story, Dennis needed to do it. So here we are, gang. Yeah. So let me, let me get racked up here. 
and uh, we'll start with the chalice lighting. And Monica will provide, Reverend Monica will provide the fire because I don't know how to use the lighter. <laughs> Let us bow down in reverence, not before carved wood or cut stone or images in glass, but before high ideals and challenges which we strive to make universal. Let us look out from our individual smallness to insights carved from the grand human struggle. Let us navigate before the looking glass that is the world and learn to laugh and weep and love the wide and fine. Again, the, the life of Michael Servetus, he was born in 1511, he was burned at the stake in 1553, is really an untapped gold mine of uh, fascinating historical drama. And actually, after we're done, if anybody wants to hang around and talk about uh, some of the issues and historical facts behind this play, I'll, I'll happily stand, st stay here and talk as long as anybody wants to. Uh, I'm, I'm not proud or sleepy, so. <laughs> but five centuries ago, people would gather on the village green during a feast day or on the great hall of a palace to hear some wandering minstrel share songs and stories and connect them with faraway places and distant times. And doing this, they would share special connections and that's kind of what we're here for tonight, to share creative connections with one another and with our own cultural and religious past. Five centuries ago, Michael Servetus was a brilliant scholar in languages, letters, geography, the sciences, medicine, and in fact, up until quite recently, more of his books were held by medical schools around the world than by religious schools. I know, because I checked. But, of course, we remember him best as a religious scholar. And uh, for the record, uh, I came out as an atheist after retiring. Uh, I know we have every shade of belief in this room, uh, atheist, agnostic, uh, theistic Christian, non-theistic Christian, theistic, non-Christian, Buddhist influenced, on and on forever. But this play is not about us and it's not about me. It's about Michael Servetus and the circles in which he moved. And they were all theistic Christian. And ironically, Michael Servetus was never Unitarian. He believed in the Christian Trinity, all the uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, although in an unorthodox way, and that was enough to get him in trouble. But he also believed in reason and the human capacity to learn and find our own way in religion without a church to tell us what to think. And to the church fathers, nothing could be more infuri infuriating than something like that. But he was a scholar of depth and originality in an age when religion demanded obedience. The Renaissance and the Reformation were a complex time. They were a time of great achievement in, in, and innovation in science and the arts, but also great danger when it came to religion. War broke out between the different factions of Christianity, and it raged from more than a century, from about the mid-1500s to about the mid-1600s, and in Europe, between 7 and 17 million people were killed. And this was Christians killing other Christians for not being Christian in quite the right way. So, welcome to the Age of Belief. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Age of Belief. 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 
God is in his heaven and the world is right Underneath the eyes of holy fathers God is in his heaven and the world is right Except that is unless you're Martin Luther Martin Luther sings I took a 95 thesis and I hung them on a wall A priest that lies and takes a bribe is surely gonna fall Degrading old St. Peter's thrown into a toilet seat So how you gonna save your soul? You got to, you got to, you got to, got to save your soul Oh, you got to, got to save your soul Welcome to the age of belief 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 God is in his heaven and the world is right And if you're good enough you'll go there with him God is in his heaven and the world is right Except that is unless you're John Calvin John Calvin sings We got a big problem, baby, cause you know we're living in a a cesspool of depravity and every kind of sin. We're all disgusting, rotten fruit we don't deserve to live. So how you gonna save your soul? You got to, you got to, you got to, got to save your soul. Oh, you got to, got to save your soul. The problem with eternity is that it lasts forever. You got one chance to get it right, no way to do it over. But God is in his heaven and the world is right. God is in his heaven and the world is right. As long as you don't get it wrong. As long as you don't get it wrong. The world is changing, baby, no one knows a thing to do. And nothing you can do about it, it's not up to you. All facing different ways and saying, this is where I stand. A dozen ways to save your soul, but just one way to save your soul. God is in his heaven and the world is right. God is in his heaven and the world is right. As long as you don't get it wrong. (laughs) Good luck with that. As long as you don't get it wrong. Picture in your mind a theater stage. It's dark. There's only one prop, a stake in the middle of the stage. The year is 1553. The setting is Geneva, Switzerland. And a man and a woman are waiting for the cart that will bring Michael Servetus to be burned at the stake. The man is Desiderius Erasmus. He's the foremost scholar of his generation, but he's fallen on hard times. Erasmus, he was booted out of his teaching position at the University of Basel like a pretty woman flicking off a dog tick. His crime was to call for religious tolerance. This is the Reformation. People live and die for faith, but they'll kill for faith as well. Whatever you believe, you'll be condemned by someone. They will come for you so fast, your head will spin. And that's if they even let you keep your head. Now, Erasmus is thinking about Michael Servetus. Poor Servetus, Erasmus says. He had to learn the hard way. Poor, brilliant fool, Michael Servetus. Picture Servetus singing about his take on religion. On the south end of Europe... The edge of the land of Espana, 
where the Pyrenees mountains roll down to encounter the plain, where the air is so high and so dry, the eye sees forever. That's the land I was born in, the north and east corner of Spain. Twas a land where a soul might see God as you wander the mountains. If you listen with awe, for God lies in the cries of the wind. In the manner of sunlight that glints on waves dancing on water. Looking out for the holy is only a habit of mind. Here's the secret of faith, the holy is already with us. God has given us reason and vision, the tools we most need. For God's face may be witnessed in love and in stars and in flowers a bloomin'. And the fact behind all is God wishes each person Godspeed. That's the wisdom I pilfered from books in the fields in the mountains. If it was whispered to me by the wind as I wandered the land. As a boy, as a youth, as a student, life was my teacher. Oh, whatever I turn to, the holy is close to my hand. Now I'll seek for my future with God as my mother and father. Oh, my spirits become pregnant with faith, with the truth that I see. And I'm certain if I share my vision, the world will be joyous. I have only to tell all the people God wishes Godspeed. And the secret of faith is the holy is already with us. God has given us reason and vision, the tools we most need. For God's face may be witnessed in love and in stars and in all things together. And the beauty of knowing God wishes each person Godspeed. So look everywhere, look all about you, and you will find salvation. If you pay close attention, God wishes each person Godspeed. And Erasmus says to us, dream on Servetus. Progress is a greedy master. It demands sacrifices. Now, Servetus first wrote the book that made him famous and hated back in 1531. John Calvin, I suspect you've heard of John Calvin, was just a beginning student back then. Both men were brilliant, and they were bound to tangle. But then the woman interrupts. Remember, there's also a woman waiting. And she says, don't talk to me about Calvin. That name makes my ears bleed. And Erasmus stares at her. She's plainly clothed, this woman. She's wearing a scarf and an apron. She looks like she stepped out of some scullery. And he says, well, who are you, young lady? What brings you here so early? And she says, I came to see this heretic, this Servetus. I hear he had the balls to tell Calvin he was stupid. Now, that I got to see. But I ain't your young lady. You're one of them, ain't you? One of them who, Erasmus says. One of them preachers, ain't you? You know how I can tell you preachers are all the same. That's how gentle talk forwards and grasp bananas behind. And Erasmus says, well, that's impertinent. And besides, I'm not a preacher, as you call it. I'm a, I'm a scholar. I'm a theologian. Ha, she says, a theologian. That's nothing but a preacher with a dictionary. <laughs> you bring down the wrath of God and blows and stalks on simple folk like me if we step out of line by so much as a finger's width. And all the while, you're measuring to slip your hand into my purse, aren't you? Or maybe up my skirt, ain't you? Ain't you? And he says, what's your name? And she says, my name is Judith. 
They named me after a dangerous woman in the Bible. And she says, I know a ditty about preachers. And she begins to sing. Preachers say, she sings, that a woman's a delicate flower, a paddle to drift on the word of the church. Preachers say that a woman's a sink of iniquity, luring you down to the depths of desire. You should long for the day But that's what preachers say Who am I, she asks But a pilgrim who walks in a shadow A pathway beyond your scholarly glow who am I but a vessel no weaker than you who has wandered a land where you'd never dare go in your comfortable candlelit study you never will read a book written like me so don't stand there and stare as though I shouldn't dare. I'll walk my own way. I assure you, I really don't care. What preachers say, oops. Preachers say, she sings, that I ought to be soft and obedient. Follow the rules <laughs> that are written, of course, by them. Preachers say, if I fall, it's a failure in me. And whatever he does, it's still my weakness and sin. But I know who I am at the end of the day. Swallow this with your dram That I don't give a good tinker's damn What preachers say What preachers say says, my word, to which she replies, I'm waiting for Servetus too. People tell me that he pisses off preachers. I got to see that. I got to see him out. But wait, Erasmus says, Servetus is a scholar too. He's a preacher. Why care for him then? He's a theologian. Well, if he told Calvin off, I'm for him. If he's a preacher, well, he's a damn odd one. And Erasmus says, oh, he's odd. That's true. He was a man with many flaws, Servetus. He's vain, he's pompous, prideful, disagreeable, but he was never a hypocrite. He was an innocent, in some ways, honest to the point of recklessness. And there starts the tale. So this scholarly gentleman and this woman from the scullery come to a kind of deal. While they wait for the cart to bring Servetus. Erasmus will tell the story, how it came to this. At age 21, Servetus wrote his revolutionary treatise on the errors of the Trinity. And his comments on the Christian doctrine of the Trinity were really just technical adjustments. But he valued human connection, Servetus, and he valued reason. We all have the spark of God within us, he wrote. We are capable of love and insight if we try without a church to tell us what to think. Now, can you imagine to the leading church fathers 
of every branch of Christianity. There could not be a fouler blasphemy than that. They fought like cats and dogs on everything else. But they all agreed when it came to Servetus. It's heresy. Some troublemaker would print such a thing. It's heresy that he would even tell the world his name. It's heresy. He ought to be dismembered limb from limb. This awful, awful, awful man. Well, what can Servetus say to a reaction like that? But I only was trying to show how the holy is with us. Without doctrine or formula, reason and love fill the need. All the answers we seek may be found in a quest. In the searching for wisdom, then it's easy to see how God wishes each person Godspeed. It's heresy. Authority must be the basis of our faith. It's heresy. It's firmly set in our tradition's plan. It's heresy. He tries to make us look like imbeciles. This awful, awful, awful man. And Servetus pleads with him. But why do you condemn me? The formula descended through the ages of tradition. Augustine to Jerome to our own time. To question revelation using reason and research. We'll see our ancient credo undermined. How else might ancient faith be undermined? But why, why can't I believe what I believe? And Servetus was sincere, but it didn't matter. They banned his book and burned it and threw away the ashes. And if they could have laid their hands on Servetus, they would have burned him as well. They did hatch a plot to lure him in with promises and honors and then arrest him. And that makes Judith laugh. Aye, she says, them fellows are preachers for sure. And Servetus, Erasmus asks, oh, he's a fool. What did he expect? Ah, what indeed. But Servetus didn't care about wealth or honors. When flattering letters came, he knew he was in trouble. So he disappeared. And Judith laughs again, disappeared. Yeah, men do that sometimes. (laughs) So what became of him then? Well, Servetus fled, a place where he could hide among the people with his books, a university, a place to study, argue, learn, and hide in plain sight, Paris. Paris with the finest university in Europe, Catholics and reformers arguing in sidewalk restaurants. He would study medicine and start over, live out his days, obscure, respectable, or so he told himself. He would find love, or so he told himself. Truth to tell, Servetus did not have a head for love. He had a head for books and theories, and only books and theories. Can you imagine this bookworm out walking with a woman trying to be romantic. By the eastern wall of Paris walking up the slope of Hill St. Genevieve he sings past these sacred halls of learning at the university Here's a place for starting over, building up a new life out of old. Hear the choir singing at the abbey, across the square from where the books are sold. He's singing about books. She wants to sing about love. Such a lovely time to be in Paris. Lovers stroll the winding cobbled way, she sings. Afternoons and crowds are warm And there's a fragrance to the days 
Vendors cry their products' virtues. Widows sing from window frames above, she sings. Such a lovely time to be in Paris. Such a lovely time to fall in love. Hint, hint, hint. But surveyors just don't get it. See the workers cutting stone to build a new church with a lovely edifice, he sings. Named for Saint Etienne the Martyr, who by mobs was stoned to death. Fifteen centuries gone by now, but we still pronounce his name with grace. Oh, echoes on the hill, Saint Genevieve, such a faithful, educated place. You know, I wonder how we move the hand of mystery, torn to seek a living. But with meaning in the world Saint Etienne the martyr Earned his place in history But was that chilly comfort When those stone stones were being hurled Not martyrs, Servetus, love If you want love, you need to sing about love Listen to what she's singing if we stroll together to the river, wine and dainties, laughter, lively talk, she sings. View of Notre Dame Cathedral, feeding pigeons as we walk. Paris is a magic city, home of lovers, scholars, kings, she sings. Everyone's in love with my fair Paris. Where life can become a million things, but Servetus' downfall was that his mind was always on a track all its own. Still I'll seek my fortune here, where heart and mind can share a fond embrace, he sings. I will lose myself in Paris. I feel summoned to this place. Paris, where the world all gathers. Intellects discuss and find romance. Oh, how joyful to be here in Paris, to be here in Paris, Paris, France. Oh, how joyful to be here in Paris, to be here in Paris, Paris, France. But while Servetus was loving Paris and struggling to be average, a very different student was starting out about the same time with a very different attitude toward Paris and a very different attitude toward religion as well, John Calvin. Look out, Paris, Calvin's coming. Seeking fortune, nothing less Nothing else could draw my footsteps To this sink of worldliness Paris doesn't give me pleasure But the future calls to me God, you know I wouldn't be here if I didn't have to be. Crooked alleys, crooked streets, smelly refuse falling down. Human trash is wet and stenches. Paris is a crooked town. Looking down upon this madness, God is mightily displeased. He will punish with a vengeance when his anger is released. I must tolerate this madness Filth and fortune testing me God, you know I wouldn't be here If I didn't have to be Paris is a sinner's haven With its university <laughs> God, you know I wouldn't be here if I didn't have to be. God
God, you know I wouldn't be here if I didn't have to be. Now picture in your imagination, Calvin sees Servetus, but he also sees Erasmus at the same time, and he speaks to Erasmus first. You there, who's that, he says. And Erasmus answers, that man, well, his name is Michael Servetus. Servetus, Calvin says, I've heard of that rascal. I even read his book. He's wanted. I could denounce him, have him arrested. Picture Erasmus heaving a sigh. Servetus is a brilliant man, he says. You could talk with him, maybe even gain an insight. And Calvin smiles. There's a thought, he says. A famous scholar. I could debate him, build a reputation. So Calvin says to Servetus, you, stop, talk to me. And so they meet for the first time, Calvin and Servetus. And Servetus says, yes, I've done religious scholarship myself. Calvin says, oh, I suppose that's nice. I wrote a book myself, Calvin says. And people bought it and read it, Servetus asks. To which Calvin replies, well, not many, but it was a good book all the same. (laughs) Servetus says, book writing is a condition which I believe can be cured. (laughs) And Calvin says, well, you're impertinent. And Servetus says, oh, thank you. And this, this puts Calvin's feathers up. I put great thought into religion, same as you. Oh, that's a pity, Servetus says. It's very bad for your health, but perhaps that can be cured as well. And then Calvin says, I challenge you. You challenge me. To a debate, Calvin says, I read your book, sir. I disagree on many points. And Servetus is genuinely perplexed. You mean... You understood my book, and you disagreed anyway. (laughs) That is curious. Listen, you, if you read my book, you'll see where I have the better of you. Issues of anthropology, ontology, soteriology, eschatology, cosmology. Indeed so, Servetus says. You can almost hear his eyes rolling. I want a debate, Calvin says. At the university, we can both build a reputation. And Servetus says, I already have a reputation. I don't want it. Reputations are also bad for health. And Calvin says, if we debate, I will have the better of you. Indeed, Servetus says, you'll be there? Oh, how could I possibly miss such an opportunity? I'll make the arrangements, Calvin says. Twelve midnight, when the watch is being changed, the colleges of rhetoric and religion will be there. It'll be an event, an event. And he hurries off. And Servetus watches Calvin go, and he says, You know, to some people, God is a lovely melody. To others, God is a business. Now, this fellow strikes me as a businessman. I wonder if he expects to be paid by salary or on commission. And yet, we should not be prisoners to discord and ignorance, but to our best ideas. And I keep thinking it can't be that hard to make them understand. Keep explaining one more time, and maybe people will understand. So Servetus says, Heavyweight debate. It's a quiet night in the center of Paris. Ain't no bull baiting, bear baiting, pillory or stake. Well, you take what you can get for entertainment, so we'll listen to a couple artistes debate going to hear that famous troublemaker from Spain and a serious nobody named John Calvin. Hope to hear some shocking news made plain. Then the night watch come and run them in because the king gets tired of religious bother and the cardinal's out to shut them down and the good part comes when they get discovered and they take them to the tower and go round and round. Heavyweight debate. Now here comes Calvin, got his notes and papers, going to make his point, going to have his way. But the Spaniard ain't shown. Maybe come by later, maybe nabbed already. 
No one can say heavyweight debate, but I guess we wait. Calvin's getting redder in the face each minute. Maybe got stood up. Maybe got put down. Maybe not such holy thoughts he's thinking. Where's Servetus? Where's Servetus? Where in the realms of hell is Servetus? And there's clamoring and screaming, people running, yelling, people shouting. The guards are coming. The Inquisition is arresting everyone. And students dash past. Men with guns dash past. A rush, a clatter. And finally, the square is empty. Only Calvin is left standing. And Calvin is furious. I came here, I took my chances, I showed up, I did the work. Oh, survey it is how you fail me, project that I undertook. Maybe you just think we're joking, maybe you just think it's play. This is something I'll remember till my... Till your dying day. And Judith listens to all this and says, Horace Servetus, you don't ever cross Calvin, not even by a little bit. But there was a religious crackdown all across Paris. Servetus fled to southern France where no one knew him, and he became a doctor, a good one. A dozen years he stayed in the city of Vienne. He had important townsfolk as friends and patients. He was comfortable and wealthy. And Judah says, I bet Calvin ran out of Paris too, didn't he? Showed a clean pair of heels, didn't he? And Erasmus gazes at her and says, you speak as though you know Calvin. I know more than I want to, she says. I know men in general, prickly men are and full of trouble. Now you, you're a rounder sort. Calvin, he's a sharp prick. (laughs) Dear girl, Erasmus says, you have a wicked wit. Wicked, she says. Me? Not likely. I'm just compensating for my naturally tender nature. (laughs) Now you, you're a kindly seaman fellow, so I don't mind your talking. That is the key to getting along with men, you know. You got to love their talking. So go on, go on. Tell me all about Calvin. I promise to pretend to listen. (laughs) My word, he says again, but very well. Calvin Fled to Basel, Switzerland, a place of scholars. I once taught there myself in better times, Erasmus says. Yes, she says. They drove you out for being tolerant. But Calvin fit right in, I trust. He did. He's no fool, Calvin. Yes, Judith says. Calvin's a regular quicken. More's the pity. Calvin studied and reflected. He wrote a close-packed Systematic theology, more than a thousand pages. He called his book The Institutes of the Christian Religion. To Calvin, God God ran the world the same way Calvin would. Stern-faced, long on discipline, short on mercy. This would be Calvin reading his religious papers. Words to describe God. Unique, living, true, infinite, perfect, Pure, invisible, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, most righteous, most glorious, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, and most terrible in his judgments. Words to describe human beings, fallen in original sin, seducing and seduced by Satan, sinning, sinful, dead in sin, ungodly, defiled, corrupt, most wicked, lustful, hardened against God, utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good and completely inclined to all evil. That's human nature. Terms of our salvation. Ha! We do not deserve salvation. God will save a few. That's more than we deserve. Elected by God means chosen and saved since before the beginning of time. The elect are saved despite their errors. The rest cannot be excused and will not be saved, howsoever hard they may pray or try to do good works. Not saved ever, damned to hell forever. Thus I proclaim my faith. And Erasmus goes on. Calvin saw himself among the elect, of course. He knew he would be saved 
from hellfire. The chosen were the chosen. The damned were damned. And Judah says, well, that's fine and dandy for the chosen, but them as got sent to hell a billion years before they were even born, that's a rough go, ain't it? And Erasmus says, well, even so, Calvin's book sold well. Now he was famous. He had the success he dreamed of. Still, he wandered, hoping to return to his native France. One day, he stopped off in the city of Geneva, in the mountains, just to spend the night. And when the city fathers heard he was in town, this famous author of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, they came to see him. So picture this. William Farrell, leader of Geneva's Protestants, comes to Calvin, courts him like a gentleman in pursuit of his lady love. Farrell says, as leader of our city council, Calvin, it's well known that you're a cut above and managing our city is a job you're worthy of. We're willing to provide you anything you might need. And Calvin replies, Gentlemen, you must be careful if you plea this way to me. I will think about your offer, but my help will not come free. Your money won't impress me. If you really want my aid, you will pass the laws I ask for. God's the piper you must pay. And Calvin insisted that they make him virtual dictator of Geneva. To which Judith replies, didn't they even understand? They sold their freedom to that man for a mess of pottage, except they didn't even get to keep the pottage. They gave that to him as well. And Erasmus replies, well, no matter. Calvin had a fine administrative mind. He brought good order to a rowdy town. Strict he was. But he made Geneva well-behaved and quiet. No one could work harder than Calvin. To the point that his health began to fail, lost weight, became quite ill, he did. And Farrell knew they had to see to Calvin's health, so Farrell proposed. Calvin should marry, Farrell said. And Calvin replied, nonsense. I got no time for women. They're distracting, they're infirm, they're full of sin. They cost too much. Without a fair return, I'm happy with my candle and my paper and my pen so you can show yourself the door and do not ask again. But Farrell was persuasive. We found a proper widow with a child in tow, he tells Calvin. Fastidious, obedient, she's really worth a throw. She'll cook and clean and sew and love you. It'll only take a vow. You will surely thank me later if you tie the knot right now. And so it was done. Idolette de Burr, the widow's name was. And can you picture the wedding? But as Erasmus speaks, he sees such a look on Judith's face. Imagine this. Imagine this. Judith as one of the wedding party, but years younger. Judith was that little girl. Judith was the daughter of the widow, Idolette de Burr, with flowers in her hair and flowers in her hands. And suddenly, Erasmus understands, as you must understand, Judith de Burr knows Calvin because she is Calvin's Stepdaughter. At the wedding, the little girl's face is tense. She's still grieving her father's death. But no matter, Farrell goes with Calvin and Idolette de Burr and Judith before the judge. Who now brings this woman to this marriage? Who now gives her hand unto this man? And Pharrell answers, the woman's husband died of plague two years gone by, he says. The girl is 11 years old. With the husband's expiration, mother and daughter are both wards of the state. The council and the city of Geneva have assigned this woman to be married to this man and the girl to be a dependent of the union. Very well, the judge says. Sanctus, Sanctus, Jubilate, holy, holy, happy day. Sanctus, Sanctus, Jubilate, holy, holy, happy day. 
Either let do you come before me with a vow to be a wedded wife. Love, obey, and honor this your husband, constant to his comfort all your life. And either let answers, I do. Sanctus, Sanctus, Jubilate, holy, holy, happy day. Sanctus, Sanctus, Jubilate, holy, holy, happy day. Master of our city, Master Calvin, do you take this woman as your mate? Guard her, guide her, share with her your bounty. Have her, hold her unto heaven's gate. And they wait for an answer. Calvin is plainly uncomfortable with this, but he finally answers, I do. By the powers given by our council, by Almighty God who reigns above, I pronounce you well and duly married. May God bless your consummated love. Celebrate the sanctity of love. Celebrate the sanctity of love. Our God is love. And William Farrell says, Congratulations, Calvin. We've made you a happy man. May you have a warm night of it. And everyone laughs, the whole wedding party, except for Calvin. A person with a bag over their head could have seen his discomfort. But they walk on, laughing, cheering, throwing flowers and rice, except for Calvin. And as they walk away, the little girl Judith is left singing to herself. How strange it's been these last two years since father went away. Don't know exactly where he went. They don't exactly say. They say he's in a better place where every heart is light. And if my father's happy, I guess that's all right. The world is full of changes, sometimes I could use a hand. But no one tells me anything, they say I wouldn't understand. My mother said she wasn't sad, but sometimes she would cry. And if I watched, she'd smile a smile that never reached her eyes. But now we're in this big new house, her eyes are sometimes bright. And if my mother's happy, I guess that's all right. And while Judith sings to herself, Calvin comes walking into the room. He looks upset, he's plainly irritated about something. And he watches this girl singing to herself. The world is full of changes. Sometimes all the old things fall. New cities, houses, neighbors. I just don't understand it all. But then she shrugs her shoulders and smiles a little smile to herself. And sings this. Oh, my mother says I'm growing, old clothes no longer fit. And sometimes when men look at me, I'm scared a little bit. Oh, I don't know about the future, but I hope the future's bright. And if I grow up pretty, I think that's all right. Yes, I think that's all right. And suddenly Calvin shouts at her, Shut up! No play in here. Go make yourself useful. Go cook something. Clean something. And she says, I wasn't doing nothing wrong. And he says, don't speak that way. Don't speak like some kind of peasant. And she says, don't you speak that way neither. You're not my father. You're not my father. And Calvin reaches out and catches her by the wrist and hauls her to her feet. He drags her out of the room. He drags her off stage. And there's silence. And after a bit, Judith walks back onto the stage. She's obviously badly shaken. She's dropped her flowers. 
and she sings a different song. There's plenty of mysteries in this world I'll never know, she sings. Like why does the rain blow in off the sullen sea? Why is there lightning? Why do lambs die in the snow? How could you do that to me? I don't even know you. You're a stranger in my life. I never done nothing for to cause you misery. I just want to hide somewhere, maybe just curl up and die. How could you do that to me? I'll never go back, I'll never go back, or trust you again, or trust you again. And you'll never, you'll never mean nothing to me. be cold, I'd rather be cold, and sleep in the rain, and sleep in the rain. How could you do that? How could you do that? How could you do that to me? There's bigger misfortunes in this world. So I heard tell, she says. There's war and disaster, sickness, plague, calamity. I don't know how many ways there are to live in hell. How could you do that to me? I'll never go back or trust you again and you'll never no never no never mean nothing to me I'd rather eat dirt or sleep out in the rain how could you do that how could you do that how could you do that to me and the lights go down and we'll have a short intermission uh, don't forget the uh, there's an offering basket in the vestibule if you'd like to donate and also if you haven't got a Godspeed music sheet for the final number in case you're feeling brave pick up one of those too thank you we'll be back in 8 to 10 minutes you. It's always quite gratifying when pretty much everybody shows up that was here for the first act. <laughs> Words cannot express my appreciation. <laughs> I don't have to go home and jump in bed and turn the electric blanket up to nine now. The lights go back up and the man and the woman are still center stage. And now Erasmus knows what makes Judith so hard and sharp? And he says, good Lord, I'd, I'd no idea. And Judith says, it's all right. Calvin is what he is. My mother died after a few years, and there was nothing there to hold me, so I left. Been on my own ever since. And Erasmus tries to express sympathy, but Judith will have none of that. Her hurt and grief are such that only rigid anger and cynicism 
can contain them. She spurns condolences. It's getting light, she says. They'll bring Servetus soon, so talk about him. Talk about him. Very well, Erasmus says. Servetus was successful as a doctor. More than a decade went by, and he had wealthy friends and clients. But where Calvin's name now echoed around the world, Servetus had been forgotten, and he became a restless man. And then a publisher retained him to edit some forgotten treatise by some ancient scholar, and that changed everything. After twenty long years of my vision kept under a blanket, a publisher asked me to edit the latest revision of Ptolemy. One thing can lead to another. One thing can lead to another. One thing can lead to another. No end. Even more than a woman to love an idea, you never get past that effect. And the truth deserves, the truth deserves, the truth deserves respect. Respect. Respect and affection. But one thing can lead to another. One thing can lead to another. Only stones remain silent when a notion of God calls the heart out. Who will say it if I don't? And what words can I use so the people will hear me? One thing can lead to another. One thing can lead to another. Writing books on religion near brought me disaster. I'm comfortable now and I'm safe. But a vision of truth is a merciless master. Or else I'm too willing a slave. Heaven help me! One thing can lead to another. One thing can lead to another. One thing can lead to another without end. Servetus had the finest scholastic mind in Europe and passionate interest in religion. And before you knew it, he wrote a letter and then another letter to Calvin. And Judah says, good God, that's lunacy. He didn't understand Calvin then, did he? No. Servetus loved his study and his reason and his logic and his theory. But to Calvin, reason was just a tool of Satan. Their letters were polite enough at first, but their correspondence soon soured. Picture Calvin singing, saying, we are depraved. And Servetus says, respectable. Depraved, depraved, perfectible. God's light shines out from every human face. No, no, that's nonsense. People are no good. But if it's rightly understood, the Bible says we come from God, we're blessed. Servetus, all your ramblings give me little hope for your salvation, for it's plain that you are hopelessly insane. Oh, Calvin, Calvin, you are such a puerile, 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 a dope. (laughs) Calvin was displeased. He almost burned Servetus' letters, but then he decided it would be more satisfying to burn the man himself. He did send a letter to his friend, William Farrell. My dear Farrell, etc., etc., I have been led to write Servetus sharply, being minded to take him down a little in his presumption. There is no lesson he needs so much to learn as humility. Can you imagine what he did? He peppered me relentlessly with insolent questions about my work at theology, and at long last... I sent him a copy of my book, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, and told him that all the answers to his questions lay therein if he would but read it. 
Can you imagine what he did? He ran through my book like a drunken sailor through a shrine. And he wrote corrections and insolent comments in the margins in red pencil. Like a teacher correcting a dim student's essays. And then he sent it back to me with scarcely a page free of his vomit. I shall make it a matter of conscience to devote myself to teaching him the humility he so lacks. I am determined, should he ever come to Geneva, that I would never suffer to let him get away alive. And Pharaoh very much agreed. If Servetus comes to Geneva, we will end his ravings. So I hope he does come here. Revelation is too fragile to be corrupted by such scholarly conceits. And Judith shakes her head. But Servetus was too foolish to see it coming, wasn't he? And he was. He was brilliant when it came to scholarship, but he was a child when it came to human motivations. And he threw himself into his greatest book, The Restoration of Christianity, he called it. The very title was an intentional slight against Calvin's book. To Servetus, reason and human mutuality were the keys to finding God. God was gentle and kind to God's creations. Calvin's vengeful God was as offensive to Servetus as Servetus was to Calvin. Servetus hired a printer, and they secretly made a thousand copies. They smuggled books all across Europe, even to Geneva, Calvin's city, to which Judith says, oh, my stars, Servetus did it just to pick a fight, didn't he? He knew his book would enrage the preachers, and he wanted Calva to see it, didn't he? And Erasmus replies, well, Servetus lived in Catholic France where Calvin was an outlaw. Servetus could tweak Calvin with impunity, or so he thought. Foolish, foolish man, Servetus. Nobody crosses Calvin. Calvin had condemned the Catholic Church for more than a decade. Now he had a letter written to the Inquisition to ask for their help. You tolerate among you a heretic who deserves to be burned. This man disgorges more villainies than you can think of. Please display a little of that zeal you are so proud of. Where is the enforcement of the law? Your office says it glorifies. One letter after another, they kept coming. The man I write of is a Spaniard named Michael Servetus. He practices medicine at Vienne, and there he has published a most spiteful volume. But realizing that anyone might deny the authorship of printed words on paper, I now send you something even more to the point. Two dozen letters penned by Servetus himself. Smart of Calvin not to burn them, wasn't it? Upon these pages, his heresies display themselves disgustingly. This case then being proved, your slackers have no more excuse for dissimulation or delay. So, finally, Servetus was arrested. He was questioned, but he had friends in power. Imprisonment was careless. Locks were left unlocked. And he slipped away. Once more, he had to disappear. All Europe knew him now. Authorities were hot upon his trail. No one understands the reason he would take a road that led through Calvin's own city, Geneva. It's a cold Sunday morning. Feels like I've been running forever, and now fortune finds me a trying to follow a short road to freedom. It runs through the town of Geneva. Here I am in the town of Geneva, afraid in the town of Geneva. Ah, me. And the watchman cries, first call for worship, Sabbath morning. Let no person shirk his duty, come to worship, Sabbath morning. The pillory awaits all who fail to come to worship. What good did it do me to publish my faith and religion? I should have kept quiet. 
But now it's been done and I am where I am. For now just blend into Geneva. At sunset I'll flee from Geneva. At sunset I'll flee from Geneva. Amen. So Servetus tries to blend into the crowd that's streaming toward the church, but cries go up. It's him. I see his face, the man, Servetus. It's his face. What? Where? Are you positive? God has given this awful man into our hand. Haul him away. Put him on trial. And so Servetus was taken. Now, picture in your mind a crowded courtroom one month later, Comes before the court the matter of the heretic Servetus. All parties must understand that our statutes require both the accuser and the accused be held in custody until the charges are upheld and the accused is bound over for trial. Is the accused present? He is Michael Servetus. And who brings the charge? Nicholas Fontaine, secretary to Master Calvin, which causes Judith to shout, What? She and Erasmus are both looking on, but this is symbolic. You need to use your imagination. They witness symbolically, but they are not heard or seen by the court, only by us, which frustrates Judith to no end. Fontaine ain't no secretary. He's not but a cook. He chopped onions for my mother. In other words, Servetus has been confined But Calvin has not, even though Geneva's own laws call for equal treatment. And that alone should tell you how much justice Servetus can expect from this court. As for Servetus, he looks bedraggled, shackled in the dock. He has been in a cold prison cell ever since his arrest. He's unwashed, unshaven, wearing the same dirty clothes in which he was arrested. What's the charge? The judge asks. And Farrell reads the charges. Charge one, that the accused did flee his lawful inqu- the lawful inquisition of the city of Vienne with intention to elude his righteous punishment, to which Servetus says, My Lord, half the citizens of Geneva are fugitives from the inquisition, including masters Calvin and Farrell themselves. Silence, the judge says. Read the next charge. That the accused did write in books and letters articles defaming Master Calvin. My Lord, Servetus says, I've studied law. This is a libel charge. A libel charge can only be brought in person. Calvin's not even here. And the judge cries, silence. And Farrell says, Your Honor, the prisoner is recalcitrant. Indeed he is, says the judge, recalcitrant. Take him away. We will resume in two weeks. So Servetus is hauled away. Two weeks pass. When they assemble again, more charges are read. That the accused did blaspheme against our Savior in articles and statements. That the accused is a disreputable fellow. That he has associated with Jews. That he has read forbidden books, including the Torah and the Quran. And alone... And exhausted though he is, Servetus replies to each charge, naming them for the trumped-up business that they are. Each time, the court shouts him down. Each time, he is hauled back to his cell to wait more weeks in squalor and isolation. His clothes become filthy and ragged. The jailers allow him no soap or water with which to wash or shave. His body is covered with welts from insect bites, and the trial drags on. A few hours in the courtroom, and then more weeks in the cell. Servetus is not allowed to have legal counsel or even pen and paper with which to, uh, to, to prepare a defense. August passes away, and then September, and toward the end of October, the courtroom fills a final time, and Farrell approaches the bench. We are prepared, Your Honor. The charges and the evidence are all in hand. It is time for the prisoner to speak. Let him address these accusations. And Servetus says, My Lord, I am dumbfounded. Months pass, and I'm not allowed to say a word, and now you demand that I speak? 
Yes, let the prisoner be compelled to speak. Do you plead guilty, sir? I've done no harm to any person in any place and certainly not in Geneva. Blasphemy is a criminal offense in any time or place. That charge was laid and I dispensed with it. To make an honest point of conscience is not blasphemy. I love God as much as any man alive. This whole proceeding is a farce. And Farrell says, Your Honor, the prisoner insults the court. I bear letters from the city of Basel, from the city of Wittenberg, from the city of Vienne. They all agree the prisoner is a disreputable fellow. They support us in providing discipline and furthermore... I ask the messenger from the city of Vienne to be produced. Bring in the messenger, the judge orders. And attendants repeat his command. Bring in the messenger. And a man walks in. He wears a heavy cassock. Eyes glint from beneath a hood so dark it casts his whole face in shadow. His feet pad softly forward and Farrell asks him, Your name and your position. Benoit Bautier, bailiff of Vienne. And you are here on safe conduct to represent the interests of the Cardinal Inquisitor? I am. To what purpose? Two purposes. First, to solicit confirmation from the prisoner, Servetus, who was in our custody these three months past, that his escape from us was not aided or abetted by any officer of Vienne. And Farrell points at Servetus. Does the prisoner so confirm? And Servetus is taken aback. But this, this is irregular, he says. Does the prisoner confirm that his escape from the authorities in Vienne was not aided or abetted by any officer of the Catholic Inquisition of Vienne? And if I deny this, then what? Some hapless minion suffers because they let me live? And if I confirm it, I confirm myself as an escaped fugitive, but I did nothing wrong. Does the prisoner confirm that his escape from Vienne was neither aided nor abetted by any officer of the Catholic Inquisition of Vienne? And Servetus finally says, I do so confirm. Good, Farrell says. Now to the witness, state your second purpose. I bring greetings from the Cardinal Inquisitor of France. We have tried the heretic Servetus in absentia, and we have found him guilty. In the eyes of the Inquisition, this matter is settled. These proceedings are unnecessary. Remand Servetus to our custody, and I will return him to Vienne for execution of his sentence. And Servetus cries out, This persecution is played in tandem. I am undone. What says the prisoner? Repeat yourself. What can I say? For three months, nothing I say means a thing. And now you bring this man, these machinations, and tell me to respond. Nothing I say matters. The prisoner is ordered to confine his comments to the particulars of the case before the court. In benevolence, the court of Geneva asks you, do you wish to be remanded to the custody of the Inquisition? What answer can I give, Servetus says. In France, all is decided and the stake awaits. Then you prefer the justice of Geneva. I prefer to believe what I believe. And the judge excuses the bailiff of Vienne, who laughs a nasty laugh. Before I depart, he says, I must observe your master Calvin writes that we Catholics are tyrants and oppressors and murderers, and yet Servetus is standing in your dock. The difference between us escapes me. But I only was trying to show how the holy is with us. Without doctrine or formula, reason and love fill the need. All the answers may we, we seek may be plainly discerned in the questing for wisdom with truth for the finding. God wishes each person Godspeed. And then there's a commotion. Calvin himself enters with his attendants. And when Calvin sees Servetus, his eyes flash fire. You, you are depraved. But from the heart I do believe what I believe, which only proves you're stubborn, Servetus. You are Satan sent. 
And Servetus replies, and if I disagree with your interpretation, it just shows that your deluded reason is not worth a thing. Like a pig, you're stuffed with pride, so let your faith be as you bring. You could maybe save your soul if arrogance you could tamp down. Make your peace with me and God, no other act can save you now. Calvin, 20 years gone by, you wanted to debate. Then let us debate, but in scholarship, not oppression. You're a fool, Servetus. I don't need to debate the courts with me. You are a monster, Calvin, rascal, beast, and ignorant. There you have it, gentlemen, the insults this man heaps on me. Such deep disrespect is... Oh, oh, oh. oh, you've had your day, Servetus. The charade is at an end. Let the jury speak its verdict. Devil to the devil send. Does the jury have a verdict? We have, Your Honor. And one juror unfolds a paper and reads, Having deliberated the evidence against Michael Servetus of Villanueva of the Kingdom of Aragon in Spain, we the jury do judge that you, Servetus, have promulgated false and thoroughly heretical doctrine, and that you have tried to make schism and trouble the Church of God, by which many souls may have been ruined and lost, a thing horrible, shocking, scandalous, and infectious and that you have obstinately tried to infect the world with your stinking heretical poison. And we now give sentence and condemn you, Michael Servetus, to be bound and taken to the outskirts of this city, and there attached to a stake, and there burned with your book to ashes, and so you shall finish your days and give an example to other heretics who would commit the same. And Servetus cries out in anguish, where's justice? Where's compassion? I reasoned honestly. Show me where I misread or misspoke a single word of Scripture, and I will take it back. And Calvin shouts back at him, to pit your feeble reason against God's will is criminal. I read the Bible. Show me where I misread it, and I will change my opinion. Servetus Heretics and witches beg forgiveness when they're led to the stake. Why can't you be contrite? Because I didn't do anything wrong. Then suffer for your obstinacy. And the crowd rises from their seats. They haul Servetus from the dock to where the cart awaits. They throw rotten fruit and vegetables at him, smearing him from head to toe. Burn him. Burn the heretic. Out into the hostile morning they drag him over cobblestones and ruts and mud. Burn him! Burn the heretic! Burn for thoughts impolitic! And Servetus shouts back, Show me a single passage I misread. Burn him! Burn the heretic! Burn for thoughts impolitic! Burn that sinner! Burn that fraud! Burn to please Almighty God! And Servetus shouts again, I didn't do anything wrong. Burn, commit him to the flame, burn to keep all thoughts the same. Burn him in the rising dawn and burn the ashes till they're gone. Burn the sinner, burn the fraud, burn to please Almighty God. Burn to please Almighty God, burn to please Almighty God. Jesus Son of the eternal God, have mercy on my soul. And flames shoot to the sky, fountain of smoke and heat and screaming. The flames wrap Servetus about and the crowd cheers. The blaze leaps high. Servetus disappears behind smoke and conflagration. And when the flames die back down, nothing is left. Calvin was not even there to watch. In the shadows at the edge of the stage, he says, if Servetus had just practiced humility, he could have saved his soul, if not his life. Well, God decided all this a billion years before time began. And then, 
To Calvin's surprise, he sees Judith and she says to him, that was a scabrous thing you did. He never meant harm to no one. And Calvin says, no, God decided it. Servetus broke God's law. I tried to save his soul at least, but he was arrogant. He was arrogant. And Judith says, I'd be a damn sight more convinced if you'd have charged him yourself or prosecuted him yourself or for God's sake at least watched the burning yourself instead of setting others to do it for you. Blame it on God, why don't you? Blame it all on to God. And Calvin wags his finger at her and says, you were loose as a girl and you're loose now. And then he hurries away. And she shouts after him, that's a badge of honor coming from the likes of you. It broke my heart to see this. And Erasmus reaches toward her a soothing touch. And he says, yes, and, and not the first time your heart's been broken, I'll be bound. And this time she does allow him to comfort her. She finally lets show the real pain behind her scoffer's mask, the heartbroken idealist who lives inside the cynic. Her disdain for religion only hid real longing for a world where people really live out the faith they proclaim. And she says in sorrow, burning those as disagrees with us, it don't help us. It don't give us what we say we want. It don't give us the world we say we want. There must somewhere be a gentle soul, she sings. A priest or a lover, a father, mother, friend. Though cursed or slapped or slighted, they return some precious thing. Then they think it over and do it once again. Is there no one who will look at me, she sings. And see me as human, not just a piece of faith. A person with a throbbing soul, with hopes and dreams and fears. Can walk and talk together, and take the time to hear. I long to hope, but hoping isn't easy. It bears the breast to piercing, and to grief and hate and pain. I long to love. But loving such a fearful thing And bravely think it over And do the same again Will nobody look me in the eye, she sings And see a person not a thing And not a threat to faith A person with a throbbing soul With loves and dreams and tears Who walks and talks together takes the time to hear to bravely walk to gladly humbly go before the Lord without a sword or fortress round our faith to look at life is much long and deep with much no person knows to speak your peace with honesty and hear my peace with grace to speak your peace with honesty and hear my peace with grace. In religion, she says, to trust and listen to what the other person feels inside. And yes, to argue sometimes, but not to harm someone who feels life different from you or burn them when they disagree. Servetus weren't no jewel, but he had caring for folk in his vis vision of God. He wasn't a hurtful man. That's the thing. And he lost everything. Servetus lost everything, and I know a bit of that to lose my joy and my place in the world, but Servetus had an idea, faith in every person, not just the ones who are just like us, 
Faith in people, faith in goodness that we can listen and hold in our hearts. And now he's dead and dust and scattered in the creek beds. But that idea, it ain't dead. It's knocked down maybe, but it ain't dead. And there ain't a fire nor torture can kill it neither. I know the way of things will go on. The nastiness will go on. That's how it is with some people. Use God to hammer those as disagrees with them. Make themselves feel strong. But ideas are like seeds in soil. And when the time is right and the soil is right, up they pop like winter wheat. And not a preacher nor courtroom can stop them neither. Not in the long run. And Erasmus watches her, eyes full of wonder. Judith does have her own type of faith. The cynic does have faith that sooner or later, good people caring about one another can make the world a better place. Oh, that's a mighty thing, he says. We live in fearful times. There's so much anger in the world. But if we work to work it out, maybe times get better. Working it, working it out, Judas says, that's the answer. I despise the way of Calvin, and I won't be like him. That's the learning piece. The hateful ones don't win just because they got the best of you. They win when you become like them. The God of Servetus was a kindly God, and we can be kindly in the image of that God. But that don't keep us from telling the damn truth. And Erasmus says, now there's a wonder a faithful cynic, a rebellion of truth and justice and love, a kindly rebellion, but a rebellion all the same. And in time's deep incubator, maybe someday, even with the lumps and bumps, we'll be all right. And now I invite you, if you're so inclined, to, if anyone wants to join me in singing the Closing number, Godspeed, a little story about this. Uh, a long-ago professor of uh, Reformation theology, John Godby, once wrote that Servetus's theology was so complicated that no lay person could make an accurate statement about it, which includes me. So what I did is I took Hosea Ballou and kind of filled it, filtered him through a medieval mystic named Meister Eckert and kind of came up with the theology of this play, and that's what this song embodies. So if you're so inclined, uh, feel free to sing along, uh, hum along, read along, or just listen along. Oh, I'll even see if I can crank it all the way up to the key of C here. So here we go. And again... Music is wonderful stuff. Everybody that makes me likes music should make some now and then. We don't care what it sounds like. Here we go. May we live so that we can see God as we wander the mountain and be silent to hear for God lies in the cries of the wind in the glimmer of sunlight on on the bright brilliant water reaching out for the holy is only a habit of mine may we live for a time when beliefs of two people can differ where sincerity is never condemned where the brave take a stand where to worship and follow our conscience is never a reason to suffer. And where each can reach out for what's finest with wide open hand. There's a secret to faith that the holy is already with us. That it Embraces us, gives what we need, and whatever God is, we will find it in love, stars, and flowers. In the joyful discovery, God wishes 
with each person God speaks. Let us seek for the future with God as our mother and father. Let our spirits be pregnant with faith, with the truth that we see. Let us go forth in hope and rejoicing, and then most of all, be we grateful with the power to love and be gentle. God wishes Godspeed. Yes, hang on to the secret that holy is already with us. We've been given each one of the tools that we ever will need. So look everywhere, look all about you, for there is abundance in the joyful discovery. God wishes each person Godspeed. In the joyful discovery, God wishes each person Godspeed. Thank you. Ain't going to be no encore. <laughs> but again, if anybody wants to hang around, it's totally up to you. I'll hang here as long as anybody wants to, uh, uh, if you want to talk over any of the historical tidbits behind this or issues at light. Uh, one thing I will mention, I mentioned when I spoke about this five years ago, that historical drama is not history. And, and one big reason... And you can talk about the movie Oppenheimer or the play Richard III or this lesser drama that history, historians work to try to find out what happened and who did what and what it meant at the time. But historical drama is to use history as a vehicle to examine issues of our own time. And uh, so that's, that's what the attempt is here. But if anybody wants to hang around and talk, I am going to sit down, but I'm happy to talk about it.